documentaries have opened many eyes to many of the causes and dangers of Islamic terrorism. What moved you to become involved in this subject? وزعنا حلو كتير كتير لأنه برضه هم هدول أعداء أعداء الإسلام وبحاربوا بالإسلام. I came back from vacation and I don't often watch French television, but for some reason this evening I watched French television and there was the famous uh, cases of Mohamed al-Dura supposedly being, uh, having been killed by Israeli soldiers. For some reason it struck me and uh, in those days I was running a pretty big group of magazines and I was also trained as a filmmaker and a journalist and I, I, I just wanted to get involved because Having to listen to French media every day, who were talking about Israeli soldiers as monsters and murderers, and uh, having to watch those images on French television again and again and again, was really hurting me in my Jewish sensitivity. So I said, I know some things, I can do some things, maybe I can do something. And I, I became involved, which means I just jumped in the plane, went to Israel, tried to meet some people, and started interviewing people here and there, and uh, trying to put a film together. Six months later, I had a film in my hands, which was the first one of a long serial of films, and this, was, this one was called Israel and the War of Images, and I was already trying to uh, show and, and debuke all of the propaganda built by the Palestinian Authority. That's how I started. Thank you. And in your previous documentary, Suicide Killer, you entered into the mind of the Palestinian suicide killer. Unfortunately. Unfortunately. What, in your opinion, made these terrorists embrace the cult of death? It's a neurosis at the level of a civilization which has been organized and which is a result of the fact that religion and uh, civil life are one in the Muslim world. In other words, there is no separation between the religious rules and the civilian rules. Therefore, you give in the Muslim, in Islam, the power to people who actually are fanatics and have one goal, because Islam cannot exist unless they prevail, unless they invade the rest of the world. It's the first rule and the first principle of Islam is that every single human being, by the end of the days, will, will become a Muslim. But to see countries like Israel and the United States of America and the rest of the world in general, which are so successful, inventing, discovering, people have a good life, women are equal to men, it's so much against the principles of, of Islam that it's not acceptable for them. Therefore, lately, they, uh, they, there has been a lot of new theories saying that Islam is no longer pure, and that's the reason why the other, uh, the other civilizations are successful and they are not. So, uh, as a result, you have theoricians of Islam, like the Wahhabists, who decided and are trying to prove that the only way for Islam to succeed is to go back to the times of Muhammad. Of Muhammad. Times of Muhammad means that the women have no freedom at all, that all of the modern inventions don't exist anymore. It's basically what the Taliban were trying to do, and it's basically what Bin Laden was trying to do. And uh, at the end of the day, this is leading people to a desperate state of mind. Because today, it's absolutely impossible to live like in the Middle Ages. But in order to keep going on, they need brainwashed people, and in order to brainwash them, they have to maintain them in a high level of frustration. So it's an organized frustration at the level of a society. And this frustration leads individuals to hate themselves. They, hate, they, they, they lead individuals to hate flesh, to hate everything which is material. The only thing which is pure according to them is Islam, is the soul, is the afterlife. أنا بدي أنزل شهيد من شان الله والوطن و... والله بعطيني حسنات وبعطي بدخلني الجنة. Basically, having organized a society where everything is repressive, everything is forbidden, leads people at the individual level to live in permanent anxiety 
when you are living anxiety and especially you're surrounded with violence and you have no hope for the future because in the Muslim world if you don't have money you cannot have a wife if you don't have a wife you cannot have sex so what about the libido of those individuals who cannot have anything they want the only only result is for them to hate the flesh and to dream of an afterlife where everything is going to be okay everything is going to be possible they're going to be surrounded with 72 virgins the only thing they have to do is just to keep kill a few Jews or a few Americans because those are the enemies, those, those are impure, those are, those are were made by the demon. Actually in the Muslim world, the men are made by God and the women are made by the, by the demon. So you're dealing with a society, a civilization where there is absolutely no possibility of hope until and unless they have enlightenment, like the Christians have had their enlightenment in the 17th century. Mm -hmm. It's not going to happen soon, and we're going to have another century to wait for them to awake. Thank you. And then another, another thing, the new film that you're showing today, Suicide Killings, Proliferation, The Path to Darkness, you have exposed the process of religious brainwashing. Could you share some of your experiences with making this film and some of the insights you gained doing the documentary? Sure. Well, first of all, this film is kind of a sequel to Suicide Killers, which is my most famous film and which, as you know, uh, was uh, nomina not nominated but considered for an Oscar in 2007. But uh, I could not stop after that because when you've been spending uh, days and weeks with suicide terrorists, whether it's in Israeli jails or actually on the field, and their families. Uh, you open the door to a lot of knowledge, which, are, which is a very weird knowledge. And you, it's not an obsession, of course, but when you start learning about something, you want to go to the end. So I knew a lot of things about the process of becoming a suicide bomber, but I, didn't, I had not gone to the very end of it with my first film. So I had to move on and do something else. Although dealing only with Palestinian terrorists is not enough because suicide killing doesn't happen only under Islam. It was also happening in the United States of America, like in Virginia Tech, in Columbine. The kids were doing the same things that suicide bombers do around the world in the name of Islam, but they were doing it for personal purposes. So I wanted to see what was the difference between the mind of, let's say, Shaw, who killed 33 people mm -hmm. in Virginia Tech, and the average suicide bomber who lives in Palestine, in Palestinian territories. So this is why I wanted to go deeper. And then I thought, what about kamikaze from World War II? So we went ahead and interviewed also kamikaze from World War II, see what they had in their mind, mm -hmm. and how they were approaching the phenomenon of uh, suicide killers and especially suicide terrorists. I will let you discover what they had to say because they were not very happy that a terrorist would be called kamikaze. That's right, they certainly won't. <laughs>